your language status? Are you in a stable monolingual relationship with a language? Just fell into it without thinking? Or are you bilingual? So you've got it going on with one language at home and another language at work? But I know, you're a bit of a polyglot, huh? That's quietly. So yesterday, what was it? French? Today, English, tomorrow, Japanese. And you're fantasizing about, um, let me think, Arabic. <laughs> Hindi? Mandarin? Swedish? Yeah, nice. <laughs> if you were to ask me what my language status is, I'd have to say it's complicated. My mother grew up in Germany and came out to Australia when she was 10. When I was young, I had to wear lederhosen and eat sauerkraut, but there was no language. When I got to school and did German in high school class, it was just hard work for me. So, for example, to learn the genders of nouns, what was it? So spoon. Well, knife is new to fork is feminine, spoon masculine. Dear Luffel. That's hard work, isn't it? I could have been a native speaker of German as well as English. That would have been wired in my head. But instead, I basically needed to do the adult learning style for that language. So, one year I was 16. During the year, I participated in a German poetry competition. At the end of the year, I went to a summer school, and there was a girl there I really liked, who was apparently to German. So I, um, I found her on her own one day, and I just let it be known that I, you know, I speak German. And, oh, by the way, Miss um, Bar and König and Tula got and she cut me off. It's not pronounced like that. I felt so humiliated. I didn't speak to her again. And um, I kind of lost my motivation for learning a language. It's a bit embarrassing how shallow my motivation was, but that's... <laughs> it gets more complicated. My um, grandfather came out from... Um, sorry. My grandfather used to tell stories about what it was like living in Germany between the wars. When he died, when I was 22, it suddenly dawned on me that I don't get to hear his voice anymore. And it just felt like such a loss. I couldn't connect across generations. So what did I end up doing with my life? Here I am as a linguist, recording speakers of a language in Papua New Guinea, I had to learn Pidgin English to work with these men. And here in Brazil, speakers of the Tembe language, I had to learn Portuguese in order to work with him. And here in Cameroon, with speakers of the Cham language, and I had to learn French in order to work with them. So you see, although language is complicated for me, it's been quite a journey, and I'm so happy about that. And apart from my grandfather's story and the disconnect there, which has been motivating me all these years, something else happened in Yaoundé that was profoundly motivating. So one day, I was driving in Yaoundé, capital of Cameroon, and I came to a military checkpoint. And there was the, um, the boom gate down, a nasty uh, string of spikes in the road and a soldier waving a gun, automatic weapon, and coming over to me in the car, banging on the window saying, Ugomago, Ugomago. And there I was inside, thinking, what do I say? I was, I was in fear of my life. And then it dawned on me, he was speaking a language 
12 languages away from Yaoundé, which I had been working on. And so I just waited. What do I say? What do I say? And then it came. Mung go ba mung. And I said it again, so we got it. Mung go ba mung. I'm going home. Well, you should have seen the transformation in this man's face. He was delighted. His eyes were open and he was amazed. He called over the other soldiers and he introduced me. This is my brother from the village. After that moment, every time I came to that checkpoint, they saluted and waved me through like royalty. <laughs> that was profoundly motivating for me. What about you? What's your language status? Are you monolingual? So you mean to tell me you have never experienced what it is to communicate with somebody in another language? If that's the case, I want to tell you that you're missing out on a very important aspect of what it means to be a human. Do you have a bucket list? I want to put language learning on your bucket list. Oh, so you don't have time? You're too busy to learn a language? I'm not saying to have mastered it, I'm saying get started with it. What have I told you? that your brain will age more slowly if it's a bilingual brain. Bilingual brains show slower cognitive aging and delayed onset of dementia. You may discover that you have a different personality in another language, as I did. That changed my life. Which language would you choose? Well, there's lots of immigrant languages around about. Here in Darwin, there's 80 immigrant communities. Or you could go back to that home language that you stopped speaking when you were 10. Or you could learn one of the original languages of the place where you live. This is such an important point, I want to give it a name. Sarah Palin said, if you're in America, speak American. If you're in America, speak American. So, I guess Sarah Palin noticed this flood of immigrants coming into America, speaking their languages. Interlopers. She wanted people to speak English. English was their first, damn it. How about we hack Sarah Palin's language so one of Sarah Palin's legacies ends up being this. Speak the original language of the place where you live. So in America, if you're in America, speak Apache, Cherokee, Navajo. If you're in France, speak Occitan, Corsican, Breton. There's 20 original languages of France to choose from besides French. And if you're in Australia, get a load of this. Yes. My goodness. Speak Aranda, Ghana, Wiradjuri, Walbri, Yogamata, Gunwinku, Larakia. There's courses online materials, but ultimately you need to sit with speakers, muster your courage, open your mouth and start forming words like a baby. And that's vulnerable. People are going to laugh and you need to deal with it. When my grandfather came to Australia, he was working on a farm. One day, a snake approached, and he grabbed his rifle, and he shot it. And it kept coming, 
And he shot it again and again, and six times it kept coming. Then a local grabbed the rifle off my grandfather and just bludgeoned the snake to death. <laughs> and chucked it over the fence. And according to my grandfather, at least, there were six bullet holes in that snake. But, well, I'll grant him that. Then that local guy, the son of the owner of that farm, said to my grandfather, that snake was an especially dangerous kind of snake. It's called a trouser snake. For years, my grandfather loved telling the story of the trouser snake that wouldn't die. <laughs> it got a wonderful reaction. It was a long time later that he discovered his mistake and learned the true meaning of trouser snake. <laughs> Happened to me. I was in Brazil, in the Amazon. I was sitting with a group of men telling me stories, doing my work as a linguist. One of them was telling this funny story. I was really looking forward to getting it translated. Two days later, I got it translated. This is how the story went. You see, here's a white man. He thinks he's an Indian. He doesn't know how to fish. He doesn't know how to hunt. He doesn't know the songs of the monkeys. He doesn't know the story of the Kurupira. And on and on went his diatribe about my ignorance. And here I was, alone in the situation, feeling like a fool. And to cap it off, there I was with those men, holding a microphone, smiling, thinking, wow, I'm getting a great story here. <laughs> and get a load of this language. There's 60 speakers left. They're behaving like their dominant language, with me as the English speaker in the minority. But yeah, I guess I deserved it. Must have the tables turned. That attitude of the dominant culture towards those who would want to enter and come in and learn? How could we address that? Could we transform culture? Could we hack the dominant culture? I think there might be a way to do this. But we need to turn to some wisdom from what we might, in our blinkered view of the world, consider to be an unlikely source. It's the Rama people of Nicaragua, a coastal group of 2,000 people. Three years ago, the Rama people said, via some linguists to the world, please stop calling our language a heritage language. Please stop calling our language an indigenous language. Please stop calling our language an ethnic language. Call it a treasure language. Not threatened, not endangered, not disappearing, but treasure. Why? Because we believe our language is gold. It was buried, almost lost, but we're rediscovering it. And we want to show it and share it. That's what the Rama people ask of the rest of the world concerning their language. And I think it contains the wisdom that we need. Now, of course, every language is a treasure, and every language has treasures that are being lost, even English. We get that, don't we? But could we adopt this proposal of the Rama people and refer using treasure language to the thousands of small languages still spoken in the world today? Could we do that? And I want to add my own postscript to the request of the Rama people. Can we stop referring to the last generation of speakers or the last speaker 
of a language. To me, that feels like a negative prophecy. It feels like a loss of faith or a curse to say, you lot, you're the last generation. And can we stop talking about saving dying languages? Saving languages, that is so extraordinarily patronizing. They're people, not languages. They're grown-ups who choose to speak the languages that they want to speak. Instead of going in with our technology for saving languages, and our funding campaigns for saving languages, what if we took the challenge of the Rama people to treasure language? In other words, it's a change of heart. It's a new openness to this otherness in our midst that might sometimes be threatening to us. If we were to really do that, what would it look like? Could you imagine? Treasure language? We'd want to celebrate, wouldn't we? We'd want to throw language parties. What would they look like? They'd be gatherings where we bring together speakers of indigenous languages and ethnic and, and, and immigrant languages, but we're not going to call them that, are we? When we bring together speakers of treasure languages to listen to stories in the original language. Listen to languages with an unbroken tradition of storytelling. Listen to appreciate the musicality of the language, the beauty, the verbal art of the language as it's delivered. Can you imagine what that would be like? Listening to appreciate the beauty of the world's linguistic diversity, that is an extraordinary privilege that we have this treasure in our midst, a treasure to transform us. What must that do for the speakers of these languages? Their language is being recognized publicly in spaces that are normally reserved for high culture. And we're saying, you're there. We're listening. We want to hear from you. Your stories are gold. And they are. They're extraordinary. And they sound beautiful. And if we do this, it connects us to the people around us in a new way, strengthens our communities, and enriches our lives. That's the gift of the treasure languages for us if we wanted to open our lives to receive that gift. Could we do that? I'd like, you to, uh, I'd like to ask you to do three things. To learn greetings in the small languages, the treasure languages spoken by your colleagues, workmates, people at the shops, your neighbours. Number two, if you're a parent and bilingual, I'd like to encourage you to keep your language strong. And when your child objects, as your child will certainly do, just say, this is our household, we eat vegetables, we speak this language, Deal with it. That child will master the dominant language regardless of you. And when they're a grown-up, they'll thank you that they're bilingual. If you're a parent who's not bilingual, enroll your child in a school which has full immersion in a language. And then adopt that language as your little mascot language for your family at home and learn alongside your children. And finally, if you're in the monolingual minority, add language learning to your bucket list. Why? Why would you do this? Do this risky thing which 
exposes us to people laughing at us, that we feel inadequate or stupid. Why? Do you understand the point of what I'm saying to you here today? Twenty years ago, I was pulled up at a checkpoint in Cameroon with this angry soldier shouting at me. Four words completely changed the situation. I'm going home. But I was already home. Right in that instant at the checkpoint with my brother from the village. Thank you.